quite on time. I can't believe it. After 17 speakers, uh, our last speaker, congratulations. <laughs> but look how many people stay. I can tell you this there are more people here now than there were at the very first one of 848. Yeah, I was at 848. Anyway, uh, our last speaker is Marissa Home. Uh, her faculty mentor uh, is Jen Shuan Wally Wang, uh, and the title of her talk is The Role of Transcriptional Co-Regulator CCAR1 in Glucocorticoid-Regulated Gene Expression and... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, so hi, my name is Marissa. Uh, thanks for waiting around. So yeah, my project is really involved with um, the co-regulator CCAR1 and how it's involved with uh, glucocorticoid-regulated gene expression so first off, what are glucocorticoids? They're actually steroid hormones that are synthesized by the adrenal cortex, and they have a variety of different effects in different tissues. Some of the beneficial effects of glucocorticoids are that they help to regulate stress, uh, they stimulate the anti-inflammatory response, and they help to regulate glucose lipid metabolism. However, there are negative side effects of excessive glucocorticoid stimulation, um, such as diabetes, fatty liver, and obesity. Um, as I mentioned earlier, they have differential effects in different so for example, in adipose tissue, they're really responsible for regulating lipid and glucose metabolism, but in immune cells, um, they're really responsible for stimulating this anti-inflammatory response. So one of the main questions that scientists and researchers have is, um, can you dissociate the beneficial anti-inflammatory effect from the negative metabolic effects? That would allow you to use synthetic glucocorticoids, such as prednisone and cortisone, for prolonged periods of time. Um, so this is kind of the general mechanism of action for glucocorticoids and nuclear receptors in general. Uh, so when you apply a hormone or ligand, in this case a glucocorticoid or GC, to a cell, it will enter the cytoplasm um, where it will bind to the glucocorticoid receptor, or GR. Uh, the GR is normally bound to a heat shock protein 90, and that actually inactivates it. By binding to its ligand, uh, the GR is activated, it's able to dimerize, and enter the nucleus. In the nucleus, it will bind to the glucocorticoid response element, um, and it'll recruit cofactors, which are responsible for aiding in transcription, um, and you'll get transcription of a target gene. So as I mentioned, cofactors are really responsible for controlling the rate of transcription. Um, with no cofactors, you're essentially getting very little transcription to the point where it's almost non-existent. Uh, some cofactors can bind and actually increase the rate of transcription to make it really fast, and conversely, different cofactors can bind and block transcription altogether. So I like to think of it as um, the GR responsible for turning on or turning off the gene, and that the uh, cofactors kind of regulate the volume control or the speed of transcription. So the protein I've been working with is the cell cyclone apoptosis regulator 1, or CCAR1. Um, the reason it gets its name is that it was found to induce cell cycle arrest and apoptosis when retinoic acid was applied to cells. Previous work has actually been done um, with estrogen receptor alpha, and what they found is that it's responsible for recruiting uh, this mediator one complex, and they also found that it may be involved with other cofactors, such as closed coil cofactor A. Um, this figure here is a kind of representation of maybe a gene specific way that CCAR1 can be uh, involved in transcription. So here you see that closed coil cofactor A and CCAR1 and CCAR1 are um, both recruited, um, and we don't, we don't know if CCAR1 recruitment is dependent or independent of closed coil cofactor A. But what's important here is that this mediator 1 complex gets recruited due to the CCAR1, and that's really aiding in transcription. Um, so this is some past work involving uh, various proteins. In the middle, these proteins have been knocked down. On the left-hand side are anti-inflammatory gene studies, and on the right-hand side are adipogenic genes. Um, and adipogenic genes are really responsible for differentiating pre-adipocytes into mature adipocytes. Um, so these three genes highlighted here are kind of of interest because if you notice the anti-inflammatory gene, with the knockdown, you're not really affecting the anti-inflammatory genes. However, when you look at the epigenetic genes, you'll find that there's a significant effect by having these proteins knocked down. Um, the reason we are looking at CCAR1 to study is because it's the least studied of all of these and there's not a lot of research on them. So we're looking at, does CCAR1 play a gene-specific role in glucocorticoid regulation? Um, so is it 
and then how does the CAR-1 knockdown affect the adiposogenesis or differentiation into mature white adipose tissue? Um, in my case, I'm looking at the mature white adipose tissue and measuring how the CAR-1 knockdown um, has an effect there. So um, the first thing that we did for our experimental approach um, is we took three frail one delta cells, which are mammalian embryonic fibroblasts, and we differentiated them into white adipose tissue. Um, from there, we infected with either adenovirus with the LAT-P for our control, or adenovirus with um, CAR-1 shRNA. Uh, the shRNA leads to gene silencing uh, because it forms a double-stranded complex that's complementary to the CAR-1 gene, and that will signal the mRNA transcript of CAR-1 to be chopped up. Um, and then 24 hours after infection, we treated with either ethanol or dexamethasone. Um, before we did this, though, we checked the CAR-1 knockdown in our adenovirus. Uh, we used Western blots. Um, on the left here are 3 p 1 delta 3 adipocytes, and on the right are mature adipocytes with both a 5-day and 7-day differentiation. Uh, the first two lanes of all of these of control was the LAC adenovirus, and then uh, the other lanes contained increasing doses of the CAR-1 adenovirus. As you can see in comparison lane 6 versus lanes 1 and 2, uh, you'll see that there's a lower expression of the CAR-1 protein. So this is showing that increasing doses of CAR-1 adenovirus uh, leads to decreasing expression of the protein, which is good. Um, also, we looked at qPCR data for our CAR-1 gene. The blue is the LAC-C control, and the red is the CAR-1 um, containing the adenovirus. And what you can see is that with both the basal levels and the dex induce, uh, the CAR-1 knockdown has extremely, or have a lot lower um, expression, which shows our knockdown is successful. Um, so, for our PCR data, we looked at 15 different genes, either involved in lipolysis or adipogenesis. Um, and what we kind of determined is that CCAR1 can have an effect in kind of four broad classes. So the first class here um, says that the CCAR1 knockdown has no effect on basal levels, but it affects the glucocorticoid response. So when you control the basal levels, when you look at the basal levels here, you'll see there's no real difference between the lax control and the CCAR1 knockdown. However, when you look at the dex-induced dex response, you'll find that there's induction for both of them, but with the CCAR1 knockdown, it's actually a lot lower than the control. The second class um, is that the CCAR1 knockdown affects basal levels, but it doesn't have an effect on um, the glucocorticoid response. So we're looking at this ATGL gene here. You'll find that the dex response, or the basal levels, are a lot lower with the CCAR1 knockdown, showing that the CCAR1 has an effect in the basal response. But when you look at the dex-induced response, you'll find that there's induction for both the control and the CCAR1 knockdown. Um, so it doesn't have an effect there. The third class is that the CCAR1 knockdown affects both basal and glucocorticoid responses. Um, so this FOXO3 gene actually is an inducible protein upon a glucocorticoid stimulation. But what we find with our CCAR1 knockdown is that it actually turns it into a repressible gene. So with the basal levels, you'll find that the CCAR1 knockdown has actually higher levels um, of expression, and then with the dex-induced response, you'll find that there's lower levels, which is the opposite of what controls show. And then finally, the fourth class is that the CCAR1 knockdown has no effect on either the basal or glucocorticoid response. And you can see here, um, there's no real difference between either the control or the CCAR1 knockdown. Um, and kind of importance to us is this ATGL gene here. It's really involved in lipolysis, um, and that kind of prompted us to look at its effect on lipolysis and CCAR1's effect. So as I mentioned, this ATGL gene, it stands for uh, adipocyte triglyceride lipase. It's involved in lipolysis, which is the breakdown of triglycerides to free fatty acids and glycerol. Um, it's really the rate limiting step here because it is the first enzyme. Um, so if you have an effect here, it's going to have a downstream effect on lipolysis. So what we did is we um, measured glycerol levels um, using uh, a plate reader. And here is the uh, basal levels, and this actually looks similar to what we see for our ATGL PCR data, in that the basal levels show that the knockdown has significantly lower levels of glycerol, but when you look at the dex-induced response, you'll see that there's induction for both the control and the CCAR1 knockdown, so it doesn't appear that the CCAR1 is having an effect here. Um, and then just for the basal levels, um, there's a 65% uh, lower levels of glycerol than in the control. Um, so, in conclusion, there's really two things that we can say here. The first is that CCAR1 has an effect on both basal and glucocorticoid responses in a gene-specific manner. So that's evident by those four classes. Um, C 
CPAR1 has an effect on these lipolytic and epigenic genes, but how it exerts, how it exerts these effects is, is really different. And secondly, you can say that CPAR1 is involved in a different type of lipid metabolism, as is evident by our glycerol glycolysis assay, um, even though this response may, be, may not be through the cortical mechanism. Um, so some future directions are that we'd like to run shifts to confirm that CPAR1 is recruited to the GRE, thus having a direct effect on gene transcription. Um, and then we'd also like to determine the mechanism for CPAR1's effect on lipid metabolism. Um, and then finally, I'd like to acknowledge my, my professor, Wally, thanks for helping me so much, um, and then my postdoctorate mentor, DC, and then also um, Dr. Michael Spelkup, who's a collaborator on this project. He was responsible for providing us with the CPAR1 SHRNA, and then um, the other postdoctorate students and graduate students. binds to other group 3 receptors and acts as a co-activator for those as well? Or uh, specific for GR? They did with the ER alpha. They do find that it binds to that um, and it's really involved in like cell proliferative genes. So uh, they find that with this, it may have a role in maybe like preventing cancer development. If you knock it down, it could have an effect on uh, ER alpha. But that may affect glycolysis in the adipocytes as well. Yeah, so exactly. There's because, you know, it's, it's involved in a lot of these different nuclear receptors. The two that we've studied are ER alpha and the GR. Um, so obviously, you're going to have effects across the platform. So I'm a plant person, so I don't study these things. But like some people were using white adipose tissue and some were using brown adipose tissue. And I'm like, why do you choose one or the other to look at? I, I have no idea. Um, so for us, um, the white adipose tissue has, like, is really responsible for um, the lipolysis part of it, and so we're, I don't remember who did the brown adipose tissue study, but um, that one was involved in like heat generation. So white adipose tissue has like the free fatty acids and stuff in them, so they have different um, chemical reactions that go on. So adipocytes from one would not be the same as adipocytes from, from brown adipose tissue. Yeah. So the brown, yeah, they're very, they're very different. Very different. Like, they're different yeah. mechanisms, and then also like. Um, we studied like PC301 delta adipocytes, but there's also like, you can start with like, we were going to do with uh, like C3 h 10 c half cells, which you can also differentiate into adipocytes. So there's also adipocytes from different parts of like the body that you can. Wow. Okay. All right.